The Columbia, Mighty Revive the West, Part 1. Roll on, Columbia, roll on. Roll Table of on, Contents, Columbia, The Columbia River, Part Your 1. Power is turning out All about the Columbia River in the nearby roll regions of Columbia, Oregon and Washington. With visiting and touring information, Other geography, history, to you. attractions, and author points and of interest. Dr. Sydney Sokoloff, Dr. Sydney22 at gmail.com. 2022. Tom Jefferson. Narration by Dr. Sydney Sokoloff, Zoe Phonies, and Nathan Coltone. They did the rest. For a complete Columbia, discussion of YouTube on. navigation, please go to tiny.one slash YT Navigator. Introduction roll to the Columbia on. River region. Columbia, no power is the Columbia River is the largest dark. river in the Pacific roll Northwest Columbia, region of North America. On. The river rises in the Rocky Mountains of British Columbia, Canada. It flows northwest and then south into the U.S. state of Washington, then turns west to form most of the border between Washington and the state of Oregon before emptying into the Pacific Ocean. Two-fifths of the river's course, some 500 miles, 800 kilometers, of its 1,240-mile, 2,000 kilometers, length, lies in Canada between its headwaters in British Columbia and the U.S. border. The Columbia River is the largest river flowing into the Pacific Ocean from North America. It is exceeded in discharge on the continent only by the Mississippi, St. Lawrence, and Mackenzie Rivers. The other great river of the West in the lower 48 states is the Colorado River with a length even greater than that of the Columbia at 1,240 miles. The Colorado River flows into the Pacific Ocean through the Gulf of California. The discharge of the Colorado River at Topak, Arizona, about 300 miles, 480 kilometers, upstream from the Gulf is only one-tenth of that of the Columbia. That is mainly due to water drawn from the river for irrigation and other uses, in addition to a large amount of evaporation. The Colorado River and its tributaries are controlled by an extensive system of dams, reservoirs, and aqueducts, which divert 90% of its water for irrigation and municipal water supplies for almost 40 million people in California, Nevada, and Arizona. The Columbia River is 1,243 miles, 2,000 kilometers, long, and its largest tributary is the Snake River. Its drainage basin is roughly the size of France and extends into seven U.S. states and the Canadian province of British Columbia. By length the Columbia River is the 12th longest river in the U.S. The Colorado River is a little longer than the Columbia. The Snake River is the largest tributary of the Columbia River and is in 13th place at 1,040 miles. Together the Columbia and the Snake Rivers extend some 2,280 miles. By volume the Columbia is the fourth largest river in the United States, ranking behind the Mississippi, St. Lawrence, and Ohio rivers. However, it is the greatest flow of any North American river draining into the Pacific. Continuing down the list of us rivers, we have two tributaries of the Columbia, the Snake in 12th place, and the Willamette in 19th place. This is a pictorial representation of the relative sizes of the rivers in the U.S. in terms of average flow. It's clear from this that the Columbia River is indeed the Great River of the West. If we include Canada to look at the largest rivers in North America, we now include the Mackenzie River and Fraser Rivers in Canada. The Mackenzie River is the largest and longest river system in Canada and is exceeded only by the Mississippi River system in North America.
The Mackenzie River flows through an isolated region of forest and tundra entirely in the Northwest Territories. For 1,738 kilometers, or 1,080 miles in a northerly direction to the Arctic Ocean, draining an area nearly the size of Indonesia. It is the largest river flowing into the Arctic from North America, and with its tributaries is one of the longest rivers in the world. The Fraser River is the longest river within British Columbia. Rising in the Rocky Mountains and flowing for 1,375 kilometers, or 854 miles into the Pacific Ocean via the Strait of Georgia at Vancouver, Canada. At one point the Fraser and Columbia Rivers flow within a short distance of each other. The Fraser River is thus the third largest river flowing into the Pacific Ocean from North America after the Columbia River and the Yukon River of Alaska. The Columbia River's heavy flow and its relatively steep gradient gives it tremendous potential for the generation of electricity. The 14 hydroelectric dams on the Columbia's main stem, and many more on its tributaries produce more hydroelectric power than those of any other North American river. The Columbia is one of the world's greatest sources of hydroelectric power. Hydroelectric plants located on the river and its tributaries account for 29 gigawatts of hydroelectric generating capacity and contribute 44% of the total hydroelectric generation in the U.S. The Grand Coulee Dam in Washington is the largest hydroelectric power plant in the United States with a summer capacity of 6.8 GW. It is the sixth largest in the world. Other large hydroelectric plants in the basin include the Chief Joseph and John Day plants, both of which are larger than 2 GW, and many smaller facilities under 100 megawatts. High flows occur in late spring and early summer, when snow melts in the mountainous watershed. Low flows occur in autumn and winter causing water shortages at the river's hydroelectric plants. A significant amount of hydroelectric power generated in the Northwest is consumed by California customers in the late 1960s. Two 500 kilovolt DC transmission lines were constructed capable of carrying power from the Pacific Northwest to the Los Angeles area. The Pacific Northwest Southwest Intertie was completed in 1971, giving Los Angeles consumers access to 3 megawatts of power from the Pacific Northwest, enough to serve up to 3 million households. The Intertie originates near the Columbia River at the Soilo Converter Station of Bonneville Power Administration's grid outside the Dalles, Oregon, and is connected to the Silmar Converter Station north of. Los Angeles. The mouth of the Columbia River near Astoria provides the first deep water harbor north of San Francisco. The Columbia and its tributaries have been central to the region's culture and economy for thousands of years. They have been used for transportation since ancient times, linking the many cultural groups of the region. Anadromous fish are born in fresh water then migrate to the ocean as juveniles where they grow into adults before migrating back into fresh water to spawn. The river system hosts many species of anadromous fish, especially salmon, which migrate between freshwater habitats in the Saline Pacific Ocean. These fish, especially salmon provided the basic sustenance for native peoples in past centuries. Indigenous peoples traveled across western North America to the Columbia to trade for fish. Tides on the Columbia River flow upriver for 140 miles, or 225 kilometers. Portland, 110 miles, or 180 kilometers from the mouth. And Vancouver, Washington, at 100 miles, or 160 kilometers are the upper limit of ocean-going navigation, which is aided by a dredged 40-foot channel.
through the use of a series of locks. Barge traffic is made possible up to Clarkston, Washington and Lewiston, Idaho on the Snake River. More than 460 miles or 740 kilometers inland from the Pacific Ocean. The course of the Columbia River This shows the course of the Columbia and Snake Rivers in the U.S. This again shows the course of the Columbia and Snake Rivers in the U.S. This is where the Snake River joins the Columbia in the Tri-Cities area of Kenwick, Richland and Pasco in Washington. This shows in a little more detail where the Snake River joins the Columbia in the Tri-Cities area. The Columbia River begins its 1,243 mile, 2,000 kilometers, journey in Columbia Lake. 2,690 feet, 820 meters, above sea level. Columbia Lake is in the Canadian Rockies of southern British Columbia. The river's headwaters are in the Rocky Mountain Trench, a broad, deep, and long glacial valley between the Canadian Rockies and the Columbia Mountains in British Columbia. The straight line distance from the headwaters of the Columbia River at Columbia Lake to the mouth of the river at the Pacific Ocean near Astoria is just 463 miles or 746 kilometers. This is to be compared to the actual length of the river, which is 1,243 miles or 2,000 kilometers or almost three times as much due to the very winding nature of the river's course. This shows the upper part of the Columbia River. Starting at Columbia Lake, the river actually starts its journey to the Pacific Ocean by flowing northward through the Rocky Mountain Trench. Then in the region called the Big Bend it abruptly decides to change course makes a 180-degree turn and flows southwards through Revelstoke National Park. Then the Columbia River crosses the border into the state of Washington and down to the Grand Coulee Dam. After the Grand Coulee Dam, then there's another change of course to the west, then south where it's joined by the Snake River in the Tri-Cities area of Kenwick, Richland and Pasco in Washington then westward, through the Columbia Gorge, to Portland, Vancouver, Astoria, and finally, the Pacific Ocean. The Pandere River joins the Columbia about two miles north of the U.S.-Canadian border. The Columbia enters eastern Washington flowing southwest. The river continues southeast past the Gorge Amphitheater and the Hanford Nuclear Reservation, before meeting the Snake River in what is known as the Tri-Cities of Washington. The confluence of the Yakima, Snake, and Columbia Rivers in the desert region of the southeastern part of the state, known as the Hanford Reach, is the only American stretch of the river that is free-flowing, unimpeded by dams and is not a tidal estuary. The Columbia then makes a sharp bend to the west where it meets the state of Oregon. The river forms the border between Washington and Oregon for the final 309 miles of its journey. The Columbia begins its 1,243-mile, 2,000-kilometers, journey in the southern Rocky Mountain Trench in British Columbia, B.C. Columbia Lake 2,690 feet, 820 m above sea level, and the adjoining Columbia wetlands form the river's headwaters. The trench is a broad, deep, and long glacial valley between the Canadian Rockies and the Columbia Mountains in B.C. 40% of the river's course, approximately 500 miles of its 1,240-mile stretch, lies in Canada, between its headwaters and the U.S. border. The Columbia is the only river to pass through the Cascade Mountains, which it does between the Dells, Oregon, and Portland, Oregon, forming the Columbia River Gorge. The gorge is known for its strong, steady winds, 
its scenic beauty, and as an important transportation link. The river continues west with one small north-northwesterly directed stretch near Portland, Vancouver, Washington, and the river's confluence with the Willamette River. On this sharp bend, the river's flow slows considerably, and it drops the sediment that might otherwise form a river delta. The river empties into the Pacific Ocean near Astoria, Oregon. The Columbia River sandbar is considered one of the most difficult to navigate. The Columbia Drainage Basin is an area of about 258,000 square miles, 670,000 square kilometers. It covers nearly all of Idaho, large portions of British Columbia, Oregon and Washington, all of Montana west of the Continental Divide, and small portions of Wyoming, Utah and Nevada. Roughly 745 miles, 1,200 kilometers, of the river's length and 85% of its drainage basin is in the U.S. The total area is close to the size of France. This is a map of the drainage basin and tributaries of the Columbia River. This is a map of the drainage basin and tributaries of the Columbia River. This is another map of the drainage basin and tributaries of the Columbia River. Tributaries of the Columbia River The Columbia receives more than 60 significant tributaries. The four largest that empty directly into the Columbia as measured either by discharge or by the size of watershed are the Snake River, mostly in Idaho, the Willamette River, in northwest Oregon, the Kootenay River, mostly in British Columbia, and the Pondere River, mostly in northern Washington and Idaho. This is a list of the most important tributaries of the Columbia River. The Snake is by far the largest tributary, with a watershed that is larger in area than the state of Idaho. Its discharge is roughly a third of the Columbia's at the river's confluence. Still, compared to the Columbia upstream of the confluence, the Snake River is a little, 113%, longer and has a drainage basin that is slightly, 104%, larger. The Willamette River is the second largest tributary of the Columbia River accounting for 12 to 15 percent of the Columbia's flow. The Willamette's main stem is 187 miles, 301 kilometers, long, lying entirely in northwestern Oregon in the United States. Flowing northward between the Oregon Coast Range and the Cascade Range, the Willamette River and its tributaries form the Willamette Valley, a basin that contains two-thirds of Oregon's population, including the state capital, Salem, and the state's largest city, Portland, which surrounds the Willamette's mouth of the Columbia. The Snake River The Snake River has its headwaters just inside Yellowstone National Park formed by the confluence of three tiny head streams on the two ocean plateau, very close to the continental divide. One of the streams that feed the Snake River is the Two Ocean Creek, at the Two Ocean Pass, a mountain pass on the continental divide. The Two Ocean Creek abruptly splits into separate streams one going off to the left and the other to the right. Each stream is joined by larger and larger streams and eventually reaches the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. The stream to the left, called the Atlantic Creek, travels 3,500 miles, 5,613 kilometers joining up with the waters of the Mississippi River and winding up in the Atlantic Ocean. The stream to the right, called the Pacific Creek, undertakes a 1,350 mile 2,177 kilometers trip joining the Snake and Columbia Rivers and empties into the Pacific Ocean.
aptly named the Two Ocean Creek. It's the only one in the United States that breaks and ends up in two different oceans. The point where the bifurcation occurs is called the parting of the waters and is directly atop the continental divide. Technically, it's possible for a fish to make the nearly 5,000 mile, 8,000 kilometers, freshwater journey from the Pacific Ocean to the Atlantic Ocean via the Two Ocean Creek. In fact, it is believed that this was how the cutthroat trout migrated from the Snake River, on the Pacific drainage, to Yellowstone River, on the Atlantic drainage. After leaving Yellowstone, the Snake River enters Grand Teton National Park and flows through Jackson Lake and the town of Jackson, Wyoming. The Snake River then enters Idaho, passing through the cities of Idaho Falls and Twin Falls. After making a large bend from flowing westward to flowing northward near Boise, the river forms the border between the states of Idaho and Oregon. The Snake River then flows northward to Lewiston, where it enters the state of Washington at the neighboring city of Clarkston. Then flowing westwards it enters the Columbia River at Kenwick. Here is the entire course of the Snake River from its headwaters in Yellowstone National Park where it joins the Columbia River in Washington. A particular scenic portion of the Snake River is Hell's Canyon. Hell's Canyon is a 10-mile, 16-kilometers, wide canyon located along the border of Oregon and Idaho, just before the Snake River enters Washington. It is part of the Hell's Canyon National Recreation Area. Hell's Canyon is the deepest river gorge in North America at 7,993 feet, 2,436 meters. A popular excursion is to take a jet boat ride through Hell's Canyon. The Willamette River The Willamette River is a major tributary of the Columbia River, accounting for 12 to 15 percent of the Columbia's flow. The Willamette's main stem is 187 miles, 301 kilometers, long lying entirely in northwestern Oregon. The Willamette is one of the few northward-flowing rivers in the U.S. The Willamette Valley starts in the region of Eugene and Springfield and extends about 100 miles, or 160 kilometers north to the Columbia River. About two-thirds of the population of Oregon, including Portland and the state capital at Salem, live in the Willamette Valley. It is also a very rich agricultural region. This is the Willamette Valley starting in the region of Eugene and Springfield and extending about 100 miles, or 160 kilometers north to the Columbia River at Portland. This is the drainage basin of the Willamette River, with its tributaries coming from the Cascade Mountains in the east and to a much lesser extent from the coast range in the west. The Willamette River flows through the middle of downtown Portland before it reaches the Columbia River. 10 miles 16 kilometers distant. History of the Columbia River Region Numerous Native American peoples inhabited the Columbia River Basin for several thousand years. Spanish explorers sailing up the Pacific coast about 1775 probably were the first Europeans to sight the river's mouth in 1775. Bruno de Heceta became the first European to detect the mouth of the Columbia River. On the advice of his officers, de Heceta did not explore it, as he was short-staffed and the current was strong. Considering it a bay, he called it Ensenada de Asuncion. Later Spanish maps based on his discovery showed a river, labeled Rio de San Rock. Based on his setter's reports, British food trader Captain John Mears sought the river in 1788. 
he misread the currents and concluded that the Riva did not exist. British Royal Navy Commander George Vancouver sailed past the mouth in April 1792 but did not explode it. Assuming Mears reports we correct. The Boston trader Robert Gray sailed up the Columbia in 1792 and named it for his ship. Gray went to sea at an early age, and after serving in the Continental Navy during the Revolutionary War, he entered the service of a Massachusetts trading company. In command first of the Lady Washington and later of the Columbia Rudeviva. In May 1792, while on a second voyage in the Columbia Rudeviva, he explored Gray's Harbor in the present state of Washington and the Columbia River. He named the river for his ship. Gray's exploration of the Columbia River gave the U.S. a claim to the Oregon Territory. Gray spent nine days trading near the mouth of the Columbia, then left without having gone more than 13 miles, 21 kilometers, upstream. Once again he circumnavigated the globe, and after his return in July 1793, Captain Robert Gray spent the remainder of his career commanding merchant vessels along the Atlantic coast. Vancouver soon learned that Gray claimed to have found a navigable river, and went to investigate for himself in October 1792. Vancouver sent Lieutenant William Robert Broughton, his second-in-command, up the river. Broughton sailed up for some miles then continued in small boats as far as the Columbia River Gorge, about 100 miles, 160 kilometers, upstream. He formally claimed the river, its watershed in a nearby coast for Britain. This set in motion the conflicting claims to this region by the British and Americans. During Lieutenant Broughton's excursion up the Columbia River, he sighted and named Mount Hood after Samuel Hood, 1st Viscount Hood, 1724-1816, a British admiral who served in the American Revolutionary and French Revolutionary Wars. Gray's discovery of the Columbia was used by the United States to support their claim to the Oregon country, which was also claimed by Russia, Great Britain, Spain, and other nations. The Treaty of 1818 set the boundary between the United States and British North America along the 49th parallel of north latitude from Minnesota to the Stony Mountains, now known as the Rocky Mountains. The region west of those mountains was known to the Americans as the Oregon Country and to the British as the Columbia Department or Columbia District of the Hudson's Bay Company. Also included in the region was the southern portion of an oath of a district called New Caledonia. Both countries could claim land. And both we guaranteed free navigation throughout. The treaty provided for joint control of that land for ten years. The Oregon Treaty of 1846 set the U.S. and British North American border at the 49th parallel with the exception of Vancouver Island, which was retained in its entirety by the British. Vancouver Island, with all coastal islands, was constituted as the colony of Vancouver Island in 1849. The U.S. portion of the region was organized as Oregon Territory in 1848 with Washington Territory being formed from it in 1853. The British portion remained unorganized until 1858 when the colony of British Columbia was declared as a result of the Fraser Canyon gold rush and fears of reasserted American expansionist intentions. The two British colonies were amalgamated in 1866 as the United Colonies of Vancouver Island and British Columbia. When the colony of British Columbia joined Canada in 1871, the 49th parallel and marine boundaries established by the Oregon Treaty became the U.S.-Canadian border.
The Lewis and Clark Expedition This is a U.S. postage stamp issued in 2004 commemorating the 200th anniversary of the Lewis and Clark Expedition. This is a mural in the rotunda of the Oregon State Capitol showing Lewis and Clark next to the Columbia River. Lewis and Clark followed the Missouri River to its headwaters and over the continental divide at Lemhi Pass in canoes. They descended the mountains by the Clearwater River, the Snake River, and the Columbia River, past Celillo Falls, and past what is now Portland, Oregon, at the meeting of the Willamette and Columbia Rivers. Lewis and Clark then used William Robert Broughton's 1792 notes and maps to orient themselves once they reached the lower Columbia River. The sighting of Mount Hood and other volcanoes confirmed that the expedition had almost reached the Pacific Ocean. This shows the route of the Lewis and Clark expedition from St. Louis, Missouri to Fort Clatsop on the Pacific Ocean, and the return trip. The Lewis and Clark National Historic Trail is a route across the United States commemorating the Lewis and Clark Expedition of 1804 to 1806. It is part of the National Trail System of the United States. It extends for some 3,700 miles, 6,000 kilometers, from Wood River, Illinois, to the mouth of the Columbia River in Oregon. This shows historical sites of the Lewis and Clark National Historic Trail on the route of the Lewis and Clark Expedition along the Columbia River to Fort Clatsop on the Pacific Ocean and the return trip. This shows historical sites of the Lewis and Clark National Historic Trail on the route of the Lewis and Clark Expedition along the Clearwater and Snake Rivers to the Columbia River. Red, westbound. Green return. This portrays the Lewis and Clark Expedition on the Columbia River. The Lewis and Clark Expedition sighted the Pacific Ocean for the first time on November 7, 1805, arriving two weeks later. The expedition faced its second bitter winter camped on the north side of the Columbia River, in a storm rack area. Lack of food was a major factor. The elk, the party's main source of food, had retreated from their usual haunts into the mountains, and the party was now too poor to purchase enough food from neighboring tribes. On November 24, the party voted to move their camp to the south side of the Columbia River near present-day Astoria, where they constructed Fort Clatsop. They did this not just for shelter and protection, but also to officially establish the American presence there, with the American flag flying over the fort. Today the fort has been recreated and is part of the Lewis and Clark National Historical Park. This shows the location of Fort Clatsop and the Lewis and Clark National Historical Park, a few miles south of Astoria. During the winter at Fort Clatsop, Lewis committed himself to writing, filling many pages of his journals with valuable knowledge, mostly about botany, because of the abundant growth and forests that covered that part of the continent. The health of the men also became a problem, with many suffering from colds and influenza. The expedition had hoped a ship would come by to take them back east but instead endured a torturous winter of rain and cold, then returned east the way they came. From William Clark's journal dated November 20, 1805, one of the Indians had on a robe made of two sea otter skins, the fur of them were more beautiful than any fur I had ever seen. Both Captain, Lewis and myself endeavored to purchase the robe with different articles, at length we procured it for a belt of blue beads which Sacagawea wore around her waist. This is a replica of Fort Clatsop. This is a replica of Fort Clatsop. 
Fort Vancouver. In 1825, on behalf of the Hudson's Bay Company, Dr. John McLaughlin established Fort Vancouver, near the present-day city of Vancouver, Washington, on the banks of the Columbia as a fur trading headquarters in the company's Columbia District. The fort was by far the largest European settlement in the Northwest at the time. Every year ships came from London via the Pacific to deliver supplies and trade goods in exchange for furs. The fort became the last stop on the Oregon Trail to buy supplies and land before settlers began their homestead. Because of its access to the Columbia River, Fort Vancouver's influence reached from Alaska to California and from the Rocky Mountains to the Hawaiian Islands. Dr. John McLaughlin Baptized Jean Baptist McLaughlin, 1784-1857, was a chief factor and superintendent of the Columbia District of the Hudson's Bay Company at Fort Vancouver from 1824 to 1845. He was later known as the Father of Oregon for his role in assisting the American cause in the Oregon Country in the Pacific Northwest in the late 1840s his general store in Oregon City was famous as the last stop on the Oregon Trail. These Oregon Trail It was the Lewis and Clark Expedition of 1803 to 1805, followed by a few American fur trappers, and then by the emigration of many thousands of Americans over the Oregon Trail in the period 1840 to 1869 that secured the claim by the U.S. to the Pacific Northwest and the area that was to become the states of Washington, Oregon, and Idaho. Significant numbers of pioneer settlers began arriving in the Willamette Valley in the 1830s via the Oregon Trail, primarily in the region around Oregon City, just south of present-day Portland. The Oregon Trail is a 2,200-mile, 3,500 kilometers, historic east-west wagon route and emigrant trail that connected the Missouri River to valleys in Oregon. The eastern part of the Oregon Trail spanned part of the future state of Kansas and nearly all of what are now the states of Nebraska and Wyoming. The western half of the trail spanned most of the future states of Idaho and Oregon. In 1810 for entrepreneur John Jacob Astor organized an expedition of frontiersmen to head westward and establish a trading post for his Pacific Fur Company in Oregon. The frontiersmen, and another group that had sailed by ship, established Fort Astoria in 1812 near the mouth of the Columbia River. This was the first American-owned settlement on the Pacific coast. Astor's company hoped that this would become the major post to conduct trade with China. Fort Astoria was, in fact, the first permanent U.S. settlement on the Pacific coast. This map shows fur trade routes showing Astoria on the Columbia River as a major fur trade depot. The British took over Fort Astoria in 1813 during the War of 1812. Astor then sold it to the Northwest Company. Arrival of the Hudson's Bay Company. The dominant fur traders in the Northwest and Canada. Fort Astoria was then renamed Fort George in honor of King George III. Fort George became an important port of call for the maritime fur trade in 1821. The Northwest Company was merged into the Hudson's Bay Company, which took ownership of the fort. Fort George was the company's main depot in the region until Fort Vancouver was completed in 1825 and was then abandoned. Astor's expedition, in dire need of supplies and help, sent members back east in 1812. During that journey Robert Stewart and his companions discovered the South Pass in southwestern Wyoming, a 20-mile, 32-kilometers, 
gap in the Rocky Mountains that offered the lowest and easiest crossing of the Continental Divide. Lewis and Clark had crossed the divide at a more treacherous spot farther to the north, and had been unaware of the pass. The South Pass is the almost imperceptible crest of the Rocky Mountain chain and across the Continental Divide. 7,550 feet, 2,300 meters, in elevation, that made possible the passage of the wagon trains heading west. Despite Stewart's detailed account of the Astor expedition, the South Pass remained largely ignored in 1806 Zebulon Montgomery Pike, after exploring the Great Plains region, had famously called the West the Great American Desert. For some years thereafter an American public that initially had been excited by the reports of Lewis and Clark became swayed against the West. It was not until the trappers Jedidia Smith and Thomas Fitzpatrick rediscovered the South Pass in 1824 that the critical route through the mountains became widely known. The Oregon Trail was laid by fur trappers and traders from about 1811 to 1840 and was only passable on foot or by horseback. By 1836, when the first migrant wagon train was organized in Independence, Missouri, a wagon trail had been cleared to Fort Hall. Wagon trails were cleared further and further west eventually reaching all the way to the Willamette Valley in Oregon. What came to be called the Oregon Trail was complete, even as improved roads, cutoffs, ferries and bridges made the trip faster and safer almost every year. From various starting points in Missouri, Iowa or Nebraska Territory, the routes converged along the lower Platte River Valley near Fort Kearney. Nebraska Territory and led to rich farmlands west of the Rocky Mountains. These trails used the same route as the Oregon Trail westward to cross the Rockies at South Pass in present-day Wyoming. It was the discovery of the South Pass to provide a direct routes across the Continental Divide, with a relatively easy grade that made possible the emigration of some half-million Americans to the Pacific Northwest and to California. Without the South Pass, it is almost certain that the Pacific Northwest would have been permanently claimed by the British, and the southern part of the continent would have remained part of Mexico. From the early to mid-1830s, and particularly through the years of 1846 to 1869, the Oregon Trail and its many offshoots were used by about 400,000 settlers, ranchers, farmers, miners, and businessmen and their families. The eastern half of the trail was also used by travelers on the California Trail, from 1843, and the Mormon Trail, from 1847, before turning off to their separate destinations. The first missionary group to the west was led by Jason Lee left Independence, Missouri in 1834 and joined a party headed by New England merchant Nathaniel Wyeth. The Wyeth Lee party was the first group to travel the entire course of what was to become the Oregon Trail. Among the most important of the pioneers to the Northwest was Marcus Whitman, a physician who had become a congregational missionary in the mid-1830s. He and fellow missionary Henry Harmon Spaulding established missions in the Oregon country. Whitman established missions among the Cayuse Indians near present-day Walla Walla, Washington, and Spalding among the Nez Perce near present-day Lewiston, Idaho. Narcissa Whitman and Eliza Spalding, the wives of the two men, accompanied them on their journey, thus becoming the first white women to cross the South Pass and the Continental Divide. By then, Interest in the East for the Oregon country had begun to grow in 1840. Robert Newell and Joseph Meek, leading a small party out from Fort Hall and guided by mountain man Thomas Fitzpatrick, became the first emigrants to reach the Willamette Valley by land. In 
This is a map of the old Oregon Trail, 1850-1906, by Ezra Meeker. In 1841, the Bartleson Bidwell Party was the first wagon trail to use the entire Oregon Trail to the Columbia River in 1842. The second group, led by Elijah White, made the journey. Almost all of the settlers made it to the Willamette Valley in Oregon. The original idea was to have as many United States citizens as possible settle the area, and to drive the British Hudson's Bay Company out of the disputed land. In the winter of 1842-1843, Whitman made a remarkable 3,000-mile journey back east on horseback to persuade his sponsors to continue supporting the missions. He also conferred with federal officials in Washington, D.C. about settlement in Oregon. Those discussions became a major factor in convincing Easterners to move to the lands beyond the Rocky Mountains. Perhaps the final inspiration was supplied by the glowing reports of the region from mapmaker and explorer John C. Framant who famously explored the West with guides Kit Carson and Thomas Fitzpatrick in the mid-1840s and did much to dispel the myth of the Great American Desert. The Great Migration of 1843 was led by a former U.S. Army captain and former fur trader, John Gant. It had an estimated 1,000 immigrants with over 100 wagons and 5,000 head of cattle and included the missionary Marcus Whitman, who was returning to Oregon. The Whitman Mission National Historic Site is a United States National Historic Site located just west of Walla Walla, Washington, at the site of the former Whitman Mission. On November 29, 1847, Dr. Marcus Whitman, his wife Narcissa Whitman, and eleven others were slain by Native Americans of the Cayuse tribe. The site commemorates the Whitmans, the role they played in establishing the Oregon Trail, and the challenges encountered when two cultures meet. The Whitman Mission was founded in 1836 by Dr. Marcus Whitman and his wife, Narcissa. The Whitman Mission was the site of one of the worst tragedies along the Oregon Trail. The Whitmans were Methodist missionaries who offered religious instruction and medical services to the local Cayuse Indians. The Whitmans also gave care and supplies to wagon parties traveling along the Oregon Trail. This is a painting of the Whitman Mission as it may have looked in the 1840s. Painted by William Henry Jackson in 1930. It is part of the collection at the Oregon Trail Museum at Scotts Bluff National Monument. The Whitman Mission became an important stop along the Oregon Trail from 1843 to 1847, and the increased number of passing immigrants added to the tension between the Whitmans and the Cayuse. With the influx of white settlers, the Cayuse became suspicious of the Whitmans, fearing that the white man was coming to take the land. A measles outbreak in November 1847 killed half the local Cayuse. Some of the Cayuse blamed the devastation of their tribe on Dr. Whitman and MRS. Whitman. They were killed along with 11 others and the mission was burned down. The deaths of the Whitmans shocked the country, prompting Congress to make Oregon a U.S. territory and precipitated the Cayuse War. The historic site was established in 1936 as Whitman National Monument and designated a National Historic Site in 1963. A memorial obelisk erected 50 years after the massacre stands on a nearby hill. Only a small number of Euro-Americans resided in Oregon country from 1810 through the 1830s and these were mostly for trappers and missionaries who lived alongside native tribes. But by the 1840s, government support of Western expansion spurred migration into Oregon Territory. <laughs>
to encourage settlement. Congress passed the Distribution Preemption Act of 1841, which recognized squatters' rights and allowed settlers to claim 160 acres of land in the new territory. After residing on the property for 14 months, a claimant could purchase the property at $1.25 an acre. The United States government hoped to establish a strong claim of settlement in Oregon country, which at that time was held jointly by the United States and Great Britain. The Donation Land Claim Act of 1850 created a powerful incentive for settlement of the Oregon Territory by offering 320 acres at no charge to qualifying adult U.S. citizens, 640 acres to married couples who occupy their claims for four consecutive years. This image shows a certificate issued on March 8, 1866, that grants 640 acres of land in Clackamas County to Thomas J. Chase and his wife, Nancy. The document cites the Donation Land Act of 1850 as the basis for the United States General Land Office patent. The Donation Land Claim Act of 1850, which was signed into law by President Millard Fillmore, drew settlers to Oregon by the thousands. By the time the act expired on December 1, 1855, settlers in Oregon had filed for 7,437 patents that covered more than 2,500,000 acres of land. This map shows the Oregon Trail and alternate routes. One of the most important alternate routes was the Barlow Road around Mount Hood and by passing a difficult section of the Columbia River. The main destination of the immigrants on the Oregon Trail was the fertile Willamette Valley that extends southward from present-day Portland. When they reached the Dalles on the Columbia River they faced three very difficult choices. The Barlow Road, officially the Mount Hood Road, was built in 1846 by Sam Barlow and Philip Foster, with authorization of the Provisional Legislature of Oregon. It was the last overland segment of the Oregon Trail. Before the opening of the Barlow Road, Pioneers traveling by land from the east followed the Oregon Trail to the Dales. Then they floated down the Columbia River to Fort Vancouver. A perilous and expensive journey. The Barlow Road allowed covered wagons to cross the Cascade Range and reach the Willamette Valley. Bypassing the most difficult section of the Columbia River. Especially the Salillo Falls and the Cascade Rapids. Even so, it was by far the most harrowing 100 miles, 160 kilometers, of the nearly 2,000 mile, 3,200 kilometers, Oregon Trail. The Barlow Road began at the Dalles and ended at Oregon City. Use of the Oregon Trail declined as the first transcontinental railroad was completed in 1869 making the trip west substantially faster, cheaper, and safer. Today, modern highways such as Interstate Highways 29, 80 and 84 follow parts of the same course westward and pass through towns originally established to serve those using the Oregon Trail. A railroad was completed from Portland to Walla Walla, Washington, in 1882 and from St. Paul, Minnesota, to Portland and thence to Tacoma, Washington, on Puget Sound the following year in 1887, the Northern Pacific Railway reached Tacoma directly over the Cascade Range, and the monopoly of the Columbia River route was ended. The United States and Great Britain agreed, in 1818, to settle the Oregon country jointly. Americans generally settled south of the river, while British fur traders generally settled to the north. The Columbia was considered a possible border and the boundary dispute that ensued 
but ultimately the Oregon Treaty of 1846 established the boundary at the 49th parallel. The Columbia River later came to define most of the border between the U.S. territories of Oregon and Washington, which became states in 1859 and 1889, respectively. Fish in the Columbia River region the abundance of salmon was noted by the early explorers. The first cannery on the Columbia opened in 1866, and by 1881 some 30 Columbia River canneries were supplying world markets, especially Great Britain, with salmon caught in nets, traps, and wheels. From a record of 21,500 tons in 1883, the annual Columbia River salmon catch has declined to about 10% of that quantity. Although such organizations as the Northwest Regional Power Council and the Bonneville Power Administration have made considerable effort to increase the size of the river's annual salmon run, much doubt remains as to whether fish populations can ever be restored to earlier levels or even maintained at their current size. Serious impediments have included the barriers to upstream migration presented by the dams and power-generating equipment, the loss of spawning grounds through inundation, the displacement of naturally spawned fish by those raised in hatcheries, the supersaturation of the water by nitrogen trapped as floodwaters plunge over spillways, and the loss of the river's natural current to guide spawning fish. Members of the Yakima, Nez Perce, Umatilla and Warm Springs tribes are permitted to catch a percentage of the Spring Chinook Run, which Columbia crosses Bonneville Dam. These are the important Pacific salmon species. A fish ladder, also known as a fish way, fish pass, or fish steps, is a structure on or around artificial and natural barriers such as dams, locks and waterfalls, to facilitate diadromous fish's natural migration. Most fishways enable fish to pass around the barriers by swimming and leaping up a series of relatively low steps, hence the term ladder, into the waters on the other side. The velocity of water falling over the steps has to be great enough to attract the fish to the lade. Still. It cannot be so great that it washes fish back downstream or exhausts them to the point of inability to continue their journey upriver. A pool and weir are the oldest styles of fish ladders. It uses a series of small dams and pools of regular length to create a long, sloping channel for fish to travel around the obstruction. The channel acts as a fixed lock to gradually step down the water level. To head upstream, fish must jump over from box to box in the ladder. A vertical slot fish passage is similar to a pool and weir system, except that each dam has a narrow slot in it near the channel wall. This allows fish to swim upstream without leaping over an obstacle. Vertical slot fish passages also tend to handle reasonably well the seasonal fluctuation in water levels on each side of the barrier. A baffle fish ladder uses a series of symmetrical close spaced baffles in a channel to redirect the flow of water, allowing fish to swim around the barrier. Baffle ladders need not have resting areas. Although pools can be included to provide a resting area or to reduce the velocity of the flow, such fish ladders can be built with switchbacks to minimize the space needed for their construction. Baffles come in variety of designs. This is a fish ladder of the pool and weir type of Bonneville Dam. Here adult fall Chinook salmon crowd the fish ladder on the Washington side of Bonneville Dam. This is the East Fish Ladder at the Dalles Dam. This is the underwater view of the Fish Ladder at Bonneville Dam. This shows the tally of the annual fish count at the Bonneville Dam. This is a graph of the adult sockeye, coho, 
steelhead, and Chinook returns to the Yakima Basin. Note the definite improvement in the past 15 years. Because it lacks a fish ladder, Grand Coulee Dam permanently blocks fish migration. Removing over 1,100 miles, 1770 kilometers, of natural spawning habitat. Navigation in the Columbia River As early as 1881, it was proposed to alter the natural channel of the Columbia to improve navigation. Changes to the river over the years have included the construction of jetties at the river's mouth, dredging, and the construction of canals and navigation locks. Today, ocean freighters can travel upriver as far as Portland and Vancouver, and barges can reach as far inland as Lewiston, Idaho. Three main obstacles to navigation on the Columbia from the Pacific Ocean to Lewiston, Idaho were 1. The sandbar at the mouth of the river near Astoria. 2. The Cascade Rapids near present-day Cascade Locks, Oregon. And 3. Silillo Falls near the Dales. And 4. Many other rapids further upstream. The shift in Columbia Bar makes passage between the river and the Pacific Ocean difficult and dangerous. And numerous rapids along the river hinder navigation. The Columbia River Bar is a system of bars and shoals at the mouth of the Columbia River between Oregon and Washington. It is about 3 miles, 5 kilometers, wide and 6 miles, 10 kilometers, long. The bar is where the fast-flowing Columbia meets the Pacific Ocean and drops its load of sediment, building up a shallow sandbar. The combination of the shallow bar and the turbulent water where the river meets the ocean makes for hazardous navigation. The Columbia current ranges from 4 to 7 knots westward, and therefore into the predominantly westerly winds and ocean swells, producing treacherous waters. The Columbia River does not have a delta region where the force of the water is diffused and spread out into several distributaries, as in the case of the Mississippi River and other major rivers. Instead the current is focused like a fire hose directly into the ocean where the prevailing wind comes from the west. Jetties, first constructed in 1886, extend the river's channel into the ocean. Strong currents and the shifting sandbar remain a threat to ships entering the river and necessitate continuous maintenance of the jetties. Conditions can change from calm to life-threatening in as little as five minutes due to changes in the direction of wind and ocean swell. Since 1792, approximately 2,000 large ships have sunk in and around the Columbia Bar. Because of the danger and the numerous shipwrecks, the mouth of the Columbia River acquired a reputation worldwide as the Graveyard of the Pacific. In 1891 the Columbia was dredged to enhance shipping. The channel between the ocean and Portland and Vancouver was deepened from 17 feet, 5.2 meters, to 25 feet, 7.6 meters. The channel was deepened to 40 feet, 12 meters, in 1976. Cascade locks and canal were first constructed in 1896 around the Cascades Rapids enabling boats to travel safely through the Columbia River Gorge. The Cascade Rapids were also known as the Lower Falls of the Columbia, the Cascades, Grand Rapids, Cascade Falls, and Cascades of the Columbia. The Cascade Rapids are located at River Mile 146.5 near Bonneville Dam in the Columbia River Gorge. This is Cascades Rapids on the Columbia River in 1899. Silillo Falls and the Dales are also known as the Chutes, Columbia Falls, Great Falls of the Columbia, Five Mile Rapids, Long Narrows, and the Dales of the Columbia.
They are a series of rapids located between Riva Mile 188 and 200 near today's The Dales, Oregon. In the Columbia River Gorge. Often more than a mile, 1.6 kilometers in width. The river was squeezed through basalt narrows into a width of only 140 feet, 43 meters. The Salillo Canal, bypassing Salillo Falls, opened to river traffic in 1915. The Salillo Falls area has now been inundated with the waters of Lake Salillo, the reservoir behind the Dales Dam. In 1868, the United States Army Corps of Engineers made the first of what would be many permanent alterations to the river, blasting out rocks at the mouth of the John Day River in 1877. Work began on a canal around the Cascades Rapids which was completed in 1896. The Dallas Solillo Canal was completed in 1915. In the mid-20th century, the construction of dams along the length of the river submerged the rapids beneath a series of reservoirs. An extensive system of locks allowed ships and barges to pass easily from one reservoir to the next. A navigation channel reaching Lewiston, Idaho along the Columbia and Snake Rivers, was completed in 1975. One of the main commodities is wheat, mainly for export. More than 40% of all U.S. wheat exports are barged on the Columbia River. Recommended Videos, Columbia River, Part 1 Recommended Video, Columbia, River of the West Recommended video, Forged Through Time, The Creation of the Columbia River Gorge. Recommended video, The Columbia River Gorge. Recommended video, Ice Age Floods. Lake Missoula. Bonneville Flood and the Columbia River Basalts. Recommended video, The Oregon Trail, Dreams, Disaster, in Conquering the West. Recommended video, America, Promised Land, Migrants Travel West on the Oregon Trail. Recommended video, America, Promised Land, Migrants Travel West on the Oregon Trail. This is the end of Part 1. This is continued with, The Columbia. Mighty River of the West. Part 2. Table of Contents, The Columbia River, Part 1. Thanks for watching. Please watch some more of my great videos.